Hi everyone, this is Kathy Rosdick. I'm the planning director for the city of Erie. I thank those who have signed on to what is the first of two listening sessions that the Active Erie Steering Committee and our consultants from WRNA will be hosting. Um, this is the first one. Uh, we will be meeting with the Disability Mayor's um, Roundtable, a uh, Disability Roundtable this afternoon and hosting the second listening session tomorrow. Uh, I welcome everyone. Uh, again, thank you for joining us and those who might be watching um, via social media. Uh, welcome as well. This is a very important project for the city. It is essentially an active transportation plan that the city is undertaking, um, certainly the first one that, that has been done in decades, perhaps ever, but what uh, Jeff and Leah, who are here with WRNA, will go over exactly what the plan is, what its purpose is, and what we hope to achieve with this listening session, um, and of course the one on Friday. But uh, when we uh, first conceptualized the scope of work for this planning process, it was in a different era for all of us. And we had planned on the uh, getting community feedback and, and doing community engagement in a very different way than we're able to do it today. Uh, there were plans to do uh, lots of face-to-face -face outreach, going to events and festivals, talking to people where they are. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, that those uh, outlets are just not afforded to us anymore. So like many of us, we've had to pivot to a new way of community outreach, and this is one of them. We're relying heavily on getting feedback from people like you, your friends and family, um, via social media, an online survey, and the listening sessions that like the one you're on today. So it's vitally important that um, you provide us uh, as much information as possible so it will help inform the plan and the recommendations that are given um, as part of the planning process. Um, the survey is going to stay live a little bit longer than I think that we had anticipated just so we can get additional feedback and, and it's vitally important for us to do that. Uh, we have had the survey online for almost four, five weeks now. We're on our fifth week. Uh, we've had about, uh, as of today, 266 people respond to the online survey, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, so we're really gonna be pushing that um, over the next few weeks. And like I said, we'll probably, we're, we've decided we're gonna leave it up a little bit longer um, and try to get more information from people. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff with WRNA and he's gonna uh, sort of explain the process and, and where we're at today. Um, if there are technical difficulties, uh, I'll try to manage them behind the scenes with, our, with Frank Stramilla, who is our, our media coordinator who's helping out today. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone, and I'm glad everyone's able to join us. Uh, I'll reiter reiterate what Kathy said. Uh, every single person involved with this process would rather be having these meetings face-to-face -face, uh, because we like working with you. We, we love getting input from folks. We love being able to un better understand what people's issues are. But since that option isn't available to us, we're seeking as many online opportunities as we can to get good input on the planet to reach as many people from as many backgrounds as possible uh, so thank you for being part of that process and please encourage your friends and family and others to uh to participate in if they're not on today in our listening session tomorrow so i'm going to review the plan some of you have been at our past meetings so you'll hear uh, some similar information to what you've heard before uh, we'll talk about what our revised public outreach approach is, how we'll develop recommendations, and then really reserve as much of the time today as we can to listen to you, because uh, your opinion is extremely important to making this plan work. So it's a roughly 12-month effort uh, with the shift in outreach. It'll probably be more like 14 months or so, but uh, roughly a year. Uh, to develop a plan to make walking and bicycling 
in Erie, safer, more comfortable, and more convenient. So more people are likely to ride or, or walk. Those who walk or ride are likely to feel more comfortable as a result of implementing this plan. So there are several elements. We're about, well, this is uh, maybe not as, as clear as it should be because we're actually well over halfway through the process. But we're at the point now where we're trying to understand what the problems are that we're trying to solve as part of the recommendation. So uh, we're working on identifying gaps for people who are walking and bicycling. Uh, there is a story map online that Leah will speak to in, in a little bit that has a lot of detailed information. I encourage all of you to take a look at that and take the survey as we move forward. Once we identify those gaps with the problems that we need to solve, then we suggest solutions to them. And those are the recommendations in the plan. So that will be a map, of, a map and list of anticipated recommendations, as well as a bicycle facility selection guide that gives the city, PennDOT, other entities that are responsible for streets within the city, the toolbox that they need to come up with the right bicycle facility in the right circumstance. Next slide, please. I'm not sure if we're hung up, Leah, can we move to the next slide, please? Hi, Leah, we are missing the presentation now. Can you hear us, Leah? There it is. It is excellent. There we go. Yeah, I got muted. My apologies, everyone, for the delay. I guess the next slide. Yep. There we go. Thank you. So what we're all dealing with with online stuff these days, right? So, um, so here's our schedule. Uh, we were originally hoping to wrap up in September. It's actually going to be November, so it's not too much of a change due to COVID-19. Uh, our outreach started uh, near the beginning of June. Uh, we will be continuing at least through this week. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we may keep the survey up a little bit longer. Uh, we will go through all of the contents received. We hope we get at least 300 folks responding to the survey by the time we're done. Uh, we'll, we'll spend the rest of this month and next going through that and doing some of our work on the bicycle facility selection guide. Uh, then we'll spend late summer and early fall taking all the information that you've provided us as well as our technical analysis on gaps in the network and figure out projects to address those gaps. So if we hear, for example, from a few people that they have difficulty getting from a particular neighborhood to the nearby grocery store. Either it's difficult to walk across the street, there's no traffic signal, um, people would like to bike to a particular school and can't, then we will develop draft recommendations to address those issues. That will be a draft report. Uh, we'll make sure there's plenty of opportunity. I, we still don't know whether it's going to be in person or online to review those draft recommendations and provide comments on them before the final report is issued. Uh, we would expect that that will be before Thanksgiving. So what will the plan do? Uh, really what it does is it relies on two pillars. One of them is public feedback, which is what you're giving us today and what several people have given us through previous meetings for the plan. The second pillar is technical analysis. What's missing from the network? What key links, whether they be sidewalks, trails, bike lanes, will provide the most bang for the buck to provide more people, more opportunities to reach the destinations that they want to go without having to drive? So building on those two pillars, uh, we'll develop a series of recommendations, including a map of the proposed pedestrian and bicycle network, including the facility selection guide I mentioned earlier, a list of implementable projects, and a way to prioritize those to see which ones make the most sense to proceed first. Now we acknowledge, you know, there is certainly not uh, an unlimited budget for projects. So one of the key goals of this is to provide guidance to entities like PennDOT, who 
are responsible for many projects within city limits with how the city would like to see streets designed. Uh, by having that guidance and being able to provide it to PennDOT, uh, we're able to make sure that streets, as they're up, uh, state streets, as they're updated, uh, mesh with the goals of the city and the goals of this plan. So next, Leah is going to speak to our public outreach approach. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Um, so as Kathy discussed a little bit earlier, we really had to pivot our public outreach approach. And while we envisioned we would have been out there meeting with you in person, here we are online. Um, so we really appreciate everyone's support in that thus far. Um, as many of you know, uh, the survey has been up for a little over a month now, since June 7th, and we've been incentivizing participation with some gift cards, which has worked pretty well. And thus far, we've been advertising uh, via some community email lists, um, via social media. Um, and moving forward, we're going to be, since things are slowly beginning to reopen, advertising at some in-person locations, uh, such as the library and on buses, to solicit more participation. Um, and one thing we'd be interested to hear from you today is if you have any other ideas or any organizations that you'd like to promote this through, please let us know, because we will get you the information you need to engage the community you work with. Um, today, we're in one of the first online listening sessions, and as Kathy shared, we'll be having another tomorrow. It will be identical in format to this, so no need to attend both, but if you're sitting here today and thinking, ah, my neighbor may be interested, please um, forward them the information they need to get online with us tomorrow. Um, and we really do hope that by late summer, um, we'll be in a position to come out and do some in-person outreach uh, to get into some of the project ideas that we hear about from you to collect further feedback. Um, so we'll, fingers crossed that we can do that in a few months. Another way for folks to get engaged if people aren't inclined to jump on a Zoom call is to get on the Active Erie website. And uh, Frank or Kathy, if one of you could maybe, I'm, I'm sure folks have that link, but if you could redistribute to meeting attendees today so it's in their inbox, that would be much appreciated. Uh, one thing that is available on the website is what's called a story map. And this is just a screenshot of what that looks like. And a story map is a little bit more than a PowerPoint presentation. What it does is walk you through um, some of the things we've learned um, and we've heard from you about the conditions in Erie on the ground today. So it's a series of maps and other information just really describing uh, what's on the ground right now, um, which will hopefully help folks realize what could be, right? So the map on the screen, for example, is showing how many Erie households have access uh, to a vehicle. And interestingly enough, over 19%, roughly one in five households don't even have access to a car. So when we're talking about the importance of walking and biking, um, it's really, uh, really critical for people who may not have another way to get around town. So that's just one example of some of the data available uh, on the story map. And we encourage you to get online and check that out to learn more. Um, and additionally, uh, we've all talked a lot about the survey. So also on the Active Erie website is a link to the survey. And that is kind of the, the most detailed way you can provide feedback, although we're excited to hear uh, from you today what else you want to share above and beyond uh, what you may have shared already in the survey, or if there's something the survey didn't ask that you really think uh, we should know about. That would be also very important. Um, so what we've heard so far uh, from our over 200 responses is that oftentimes people aren't walking because the destination they're trying to get to is a little too far away. Um, and we've also heard sidewalk quality can really be an issue for folks. Um, and similarly, uh, people aren't biking because of a lack of bike infrastructure um, and also driver behavior. So, you know, as we begin to formulate our recommendations, we'll be addressing uh, those concerns uh, in, in our recommendations. Uh, the, the last way uh, you can get online today and provide feedback is uh, interactive map. So if you're comfortable kind of uh, zooming around at, to different locations in Erie, um, you can basically share feedback via a map. And for some reason, my screens are showing up blank right now. But um, basically, the way that works is you can type in an address or location and draw a line or a point on a location where you think uh, improvements would be really helpful. So that's one more way that you can provide us with the feedback we're hoping for. OK. 
Okay, and if you will all bear with me for a moment, I am going to figure out why we have a white screen in front of us. <laughs> Jeff, if you would like, I think we're almost to the point where we can begin uh, asking some targeted questions. So if you want to take over while I troubleshoot the screen, that would be very helpful. Sure, let me pull up my list of questions. Okay, it looks like we are back. Um, so while Jeff pulls up the list of questions, um, one other thing I wanted to include is that we will be using um, some published resources from the federal government um, and also some other organizations um, that basically have provided a lot of guidance on how to design bike ways and bike lanes and pathways that really work for a lot of people. So one thing we've heard already from folks is that we want the types of facilities that pretty much anyone would be comfortable using if they're comfortable riding a bike. So something that you're going to be comfortable getting on with your family or an elderly visitor to town, you know, we want facilities that are comfortable and that's uh, another way to describe that and in, in the language we use is a low stress bike facility. And with that, um, we're into the fun part, which is hearing from you. Uh, Jeff, if you'd like to take over. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so this is a list of questions that we would love to see answers to, uh, or we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. But if you have other ideas or things about how to make walking and biking better in Erie, uh, we'd love to hear that as well. So please consider these just as prompts, not the only things that we would like you to respond to. But, um, you know, so specifically, uh, I mentioned that our gap identification process tells us, you know, what's missing now? Where are there difficult places to walk? Either there's a lack of a sidewalk or an intersection is difficult to cross because you have, and it, as a result, it makes it difficult for you to walk to a destination you would like to go to. Similarly, although the facilities will be different, uh, if you'd like to ride a bike somewhere that's within reasonable riding distance, but you don't, why is that the case? You know, what types of facilities would make that ride more feasible for you or for those that you know? And then finally, are there other recommendations that you'd like to see as part of the plan? So more of, more of an open-ended question. All right, so Frank, we have Freda Tepfer who's raised her hand and I think has some comments. How will we manage the bringing them those comments in? Just so we. Uh, I'll I'll allow them to talk if you want to call on them. I I had a list as uh, who came in the room first, uh, but okay. if you just want to go by those who raised their hand, we can do that as well. That's great. It looks like Freda has uh, Ms. Tepfer raised her hand, and then John. Well, I'm not going to try to pronounce that last name. Uh, Freda is in the room. Uh, Freda, you may uh, address the. Okay, so I, I did use the survey, but I, as I mentioned in the Facebook comments, I really didn't have enough room to, to share all the comments I had. Um, I was told I was out of characters, even though there were multiple any places. But, um, so specific streets or intersections, downtown and on 18th and on 10th, there are locations where there's like one traffic light hanging in the middle and, the, and it, for a pedestrian, it's actually hard to see the traffic light when you're trying to cross. Um, there's just a number on 18th. And if you're downtown and you're walking in the opposite direction of a one-way street, it's also very hard to see what the traffic light is doing. Not everybody understands how important it is to push the ped button. And so if you are around Perry Square, for example, if you're on the northeast corner there by, oh gosh, I don't remember the name of the, the fast food, the takeout place, um, but if you're across from the bank, but if you're going west from, from uh, North Park Row, if you don't push the button, you won't see the light, you won't get a ped interval. People don't understand that. 
So when people are trying to cross in places that are on one-way streets, you need to consider what the pedestrian sees as well as what the vehicle sees. And also how a non, uh, a, a visually impaired pedestrian functions. Um, that's one thing. Um, within my neighborhood, you did a fairly good job of identifying the lack of sidewalks in Baldwin Park, but we have all these locations where there's sidewalk and then you get to the corner and there's grass. And it's it's a, a very frustrating, and I don't understand it. Um, and that's I I'm, I'll bet it's not. No, I know it's not peculiar to my neighborhood. But you missed those on the inventory. Um, one thing that would help me, I would love to use the bus more when things calm down, but. Um, the 29 bus in my neighborhood, it only runs on hourly intervals and it doesn't run Sunday at all. And so it just makes it difficult for me to want to use the bus, which I really would now that I have a free bus pass. Um, and um, the other bus that, that I could use on Sundays is the number 30 bus, but it's um, very challenging to walk on green gardens sometimes of the year because either the sidewalks are not maintained, the grass is not mowed, or on green garden, the commercial part, there's no enforcement of snow removal. And that's one thing I did bring up in the survey is that on 12th Street and Green Garden and a variety of places um, where there's active snow removal by the city, the commercial property owners are just as responsible as residential owners for clearing that snow once it's plowed, but they don't seem to feel they have that responsibility. And churches and, and businesses plow their snow and leave big berms on the sidewalk, which take months to melt. So- um, uh, thank, thank you. I, I would, I'm sorry to interrupt, but right. I, I would ask if we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. Right. No, I, I understand. If you could, I appreciate that. If, if you could please, uh, if you've put something in the survey, we've got it. And, well, the trouble is that the survey you. told me I ran out of space, and that's an issue I had. So, Freda, uh, excuse me, Ms. Uh, Freda, did are everything you just listed, were those items that you weren't able to put into the survey? So what's in the survey? You may have additional comments to a little bit of a little bit of both. Okay. All and right. Thank you. All right. So one last thing, and you know of my ongoing concerns about access during construction, and that is a big problem. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the next one is uh, John David. I'm not going to try the last name. So. <laughs> Mr. Is he in? Yes, I brought uh, John into the room. He is muted though. He'll John, you're unmuted. muted. Did you want to say something? He's unmuted now. Um, I live on the Lower East Side down by Soldiers and Sailors Home. I was just concerned about in certain areas in between Parade and the Soldiers and Sailors on 3rd and Nash. Is there any updates for those sidewalks in the plans? Or Because we have a lot of kids that ride bikes and stuff through here and pedestrians. And one side is real narrow. I'm just wondering in the maybe not this year, but maybe in the future, if they're going to be working on that. John, we will definitely take that, that comment into account. Which specific street should we be most concerned about making sure there's a recommendation in the plan for it? Um, Because they haven't even repaved. They, re, they just repaved uh, in between Freight and Wallace with asphalt. But some of the sidewalks here are uneven. And I've seen a lot of kids actually riding on the sidewalk and they've hit a bump and they've fallen. I'm just wondering if there's going to be any improvements on those or not. Well, it's certainly something that we, we don't have a bike route thing here because the roads are too narrow. If you was to look at the city map, it, it's like double sided and it's a real narrow street. So, uh, John, you're mentioning it's the side streets that lead to parade. 
is those right. are the it, it, yeah it's just like i live right on east third in between wallace and ash okay and yeah i live in a hands building that section is good but you got some that are like three or four houses down where the like the one lady even said some of it could be the property owner's responsibility but right where the old church henderson church is that sidewalk is buckling up because of trees and a lot of kids, you know, hit the bumps there and they do fall and skin their knees and stuff. You know, I'm just trying to think of a way, you know, to help keep everybody that's walking that are elderly and the kids, you know, because when they're riding their bikes, I just don't want to see them get have to go out in the road and get hit by a car because they have no, like they have on Upper Parade Street, they don't have like the painted section for the bicycles on right. street. Because our roads are too narrow. Good point. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm just wondering if they're going to make the sidewalks a little bit wider eventually. Well, the the purpose of this, John, is is to develop a plan that will determine which areas need to be improved. So, this is not an active construction project yet. We hope that someday. Well, so that would be one of the concerns, making it safe enough for pedestrians and bicycles, since they would have to share the sidewalk. So noted. Thank you. That was my only concern for this meeting. Great. Thanks. All right. You have a nice day. You too. Frank, do we have any other folks who are uh, who are interested in providing comments or uh, asking questions at this point? No one has raised their hand, but um, other than a hand raise, I wouldn't know. I can bring everyone in individually, but if they don't raise their hand, I I wouldn't uh, expect them to. Have Does a everyone comment. know how to raise their hand in in Zoom? Uh, I'm not sure I've ever done that, so I don't know if there's a if everyone's aware of how that works. So if you hover over your name, uh, it will say raise or lower hand, and you should be able to work it that way. Oh, great, thank you. Andrea, is that a hand raised? Uh, yeah, it might be helpful if you uh, enabled the chat so we could also put comments in there if we don't have something that we want to specifically address in the questions. That's a good point. Yeah, the I chat, didn't realize it was. Is it the not chat enabled? Is enabled now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have Nikan. Yes, Kathy. Thank Hi, you. Hi, uh, my name is Nikan Carpenter, uh, New American Liaison for the City. Uh, one of the big things that uh, I got from the New American Council, the input, the biggest thing is having more signage uh, in a different languages that would be helpful, especially direction, things like that. Great, thank you. It's a good suggestion. You're welcome. And you can, if there aren't further questions that are, are in line right now, would do you have information that you're able to share with the team on which languages would make the most sense in which parts of the city? We obviously can't have necessarily have you know ten languages in, on every sign because Erie is blessed with a a lot of different cultures and a lot of different folks and with different native languages. But if we could find those areas where there's um, where we'd get the most benefit from a particular second or third language on signs, that would be really useful. Definitely, I can I can help you with that. Uh, there are at least seven more uh, spoken language uh, in Iri. We have Nepalese. Uh, that's uh, uh, we have large Bhutanese community in Iri, and they speak Nepali. That's number one right now. 
-hmm. We do have Arabic speakers in Erie. And then we have Spanish speakers, of course. Uh, Russian, uh, that's a big. We have a lot of Ukrainian and Russian speaking uh, community in Erie. We have Somali and Sudanese, also one of the biggest one. Excellent. Yeah, and Swahili, Swahili also. So like, it was that seven, seven different yeah. languages. Yep. Uh, mm. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah, and I can provide the information like uh, probably which area that they would uh, that would be useful to put uh, signage in, in that particular language. I'll share it with Kathy. Um, I'm also wondering too, we, we had this come up uh, during a, well, as we were developing a sort of a, a very strategic and focused rapid response for one of the areas that were spiking with COVID-19 and also um, had a number of, of non-English speaking households, that the use of symbols um, that sort of translates over multiple languages, so you're not having to use um, translation text so often as a, as a better way of doing it so the signs don't get so large and, and convoluted. Trying to have seven different languages on one sign might be challenging, but I'm wondering, Jeff and, and Leah, if that's maybe something that we could focus on is the, the correct symbology for signage, much like, the, I mean, we have a lot of those examples already in some of our traffic wayfinding signs now, but particularly for bike and pedestrians throughout the system, if there's other examples that we would, that are best practices in other communities who have similar types of um, very diverse populations. Yeah, I think we will probably rely mostly on symbols, but destination locations are things that we need to think about carefully. Right. Going to the library or the supermarket, for example, might be opportunities to consider uh, signs in, in languages in addition to English. Yeah, and another thing some places do, um, especially when thinking about the bike network, um, is maybe identify a couple of priority crosstown connectors for bike routes. So whatever, wherever that ends up being, um, and then kind of color coding the signage for that route. So it would almost be similar to like a metro map you'd see in a larger city where you'd have the red line and everyone knows the red line goes from crosstown east to west um, in the north part of the city. Um, and that is something that can be communicated via signage and on maps um, and is something that's easily understood and can follow. And you may know it connects XYZ destinations along that route. So between um, a combination of signage and symbols, um, I, I hope we would be able to develop something that could work for a variety of language speakers. Um, hopefully it would be a little intuitive and that, that kind of gets into, you know, we've talked about using public art to um, and working with Erie Arts and Culture on, on developing kind of a visual language that everyone can follow and, and engage with. Uh, Councilwoman Kathy Schaff is in the room now and she has uh, something she'd like to say. I thank you so very, very, very much for doing this. It's so important to get the community involved and Active transportation is actively engaging the community. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, my biggest concern is as I drive around town, as I walk, as I bike a little bit, um, we need to try and slow the traffic down. And I don't know how to do that, but it appears that everyone's going at least 10 miles an hour above the speed limit or more. So I don't know how to address that. And I did participate in the survey, survey and I did put some uh, Facebook comments in as I was on Facebook doing a Facebook watch. But um, thank you very much. Um, this is definitely needed and I'm looking forward to um, see it coming to fruition. Thank you. 
Councilwoman, thank you. That's a, a, a very astute observation. We use the term complete streets often to refer to streets that are designed well for everybody, regardless of which mode of travel they're using or whatever their age or ability. And I think in the areas where I've worked across the country, motor vehicle speed is probably the number one issue that prevents streets from being considered complete streets and comfortable for use by everybody. So it's, it's fair to say we will have at least some general and possibly some specific recommendations in the plan about how Erie might best address speeding on its streets. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd also mention that there's a number of steering committee members on the call. So if they also wanted to make comments or had concerns, they're more than free to share those. And you, you can just mute, unmute yourself since you're panelists and talk if you'd like. I don't think we're going to have a rush on the discussion though. While we're waiting for them to join Kathy, I'll, I'll point out, I think everyone can see the chat, um, a couple resources. Robert Hand had a, a number of specific locations. Thank you for those. Uh, Andrea also pointed out something that I've actually never seen before. Um, so I'm a little surprised it didn't come across email at some point, but uh, how to create an instant urban trail is on americantrails.org. It's actually a, a recorded webinar that's available for free. And apparently a group in San Francisco used several hundred dollars and volunteer labor to create a significant urban trail. So uh, I, I'm all about using found or local resources to make things happen rather than waiting for massive capital projects. So thank you for sharing that resource. We'll definitely be taking a look at it. Okay. All right. Coming in on the chat. Thank you. Jeff. Yes. Hi, Eric. Hi there. Is what you were talking about with this urban trail type thing, is that something that uh, basically um, there's other terms that, um, that has been used for that type of thing, but is that the type of thing where we would create a temporary trail either for um, some event or for um, just to kind of trial out uh, a bike lane on certain streets uh, to see how well it works, to see how it gets utilized, to see uh, potential problems with traffic or with the infrastructure. Uh, is that kind of what you were alluding to? I haven't, Eric, I haven't yet reviewed the resource since it just came up today, and we definitely will be doing that right afterward, but uh, we've worked in a, with a number of jurisdictions where there may be a concern with, say, repurposing a motor vehicle travel lane as space for bicyclists, and pilot projects are really useful at determining what types of traffic impacts are anticipated what types of benefits are expected by people who are not driving in the corridor, who are walking or biking in the corridor, and putting those into place for, say, a couple weeks just to see how they work is really important. Uh, it, it's also useful in areas where large vehicles make turns. So, you know, fire departments oftentimes are very concerned about solutions like this until they're laid out with cones or something like that to confirm that they actually work well. And in some communities, we've done that and 
at their request, we move things back a couple feet just to make sure that they work properly and they work and they end up being a solution that's good for everybody. So pilots are, are really useful. I get the sense from the resource that Andrea has shared that this might be something that's a little more permanent, but we'll find out as we review it. Well, thank you, Jeff. And, and as you were speaking about all these things, and I realize that we're pretty much about transportation, um, but thinking about, well, since the whole pandemic began, um, that there wouldn't be considerations, maybe this wouldn't be something that you would be involved with, but that the city planners would be, where um, we take over some road space for other uses other than transportation, like say for example, I mean, we do it for events in the summertime, but also just for uh, local businesses to take advantage of uh, some street space that's not being used, that you'd be able to say, have a restaurant that would be spread out um, into a street or a um, some kind of event like uh, some kind of dance or exercise program or something like that where basically we could properly space everybody out so that we'd all feel safe. Yeah, th thanks for that, Eric. Just um, uh, so everyone knows that the city did amend its um, its ability or business owner's ability to expand outdoor dining uh, within the sidewalk and potentially if they if they saw the demand they could actually take on take over on street parking spaces and close a street if they really wanted that or needed that level of of outdoor dining uh, so it is an easier process i know the um I know that the, the the liquor control board also modified their their uh, requirements, and it's a quicker process to expand areas that you can serve alcohol outside businesses. So that is available to restaurant owners now. Um, we, we've not. I think the challenge is we don't see there's not a huge demand uh, to eat out sufficient enough for restaurant owners to want to sort of take on the logistical problems of temporary outdoor dining with the tables, the chairs, um, having to take it in and out at night is probably, I'm assuming is probably some logistical challenges that are limiting their, the, the demand for something like that. But it is available already in the city of Erie to do things like that. But we're gonna, we're, we're, we move at the pace that the restaurant or business owners uh, request as I think is rightly so we don't assume that the demand is there we let them tell us if the demand is there so we've got a couple more comments getting some good thank you from our attendees mm -hmm. one thing I'd like to mention too is that uh, thank you especially for, for all of you are providing detailed comments uh, this project does incorporate the city of Erie, not those areas outside the city limits. But PennDOT is currently working on a bicycle and pedestrian plan for their overall district, which includes all of Erie County and beyond. So if there are comments that we receive that are outside the city, we can certainly pass those on to them. And um, the planning and development director, both uh, for the Mill Creek Township sits on our steering committee. Uh, for that purpose as well, because we know our, our corridors and roads don't end at the city limits, so. And they have a, Mill Creek is, has a, just completed a comprehensive plan that looks at, really focuses on, on development of their major corridors. And a lot of that um, also includes pedestrian and bike facilities as well. All right. Well, 
Unless we have some more comments coming in, I don't see any. We've gotten some good feedback. Um, no one raising their hand. Oh, wait, we do have someone, sorry. Is that? Kathy? Um, Kathy, thank you. Um, when I went to visit my friend in Cincinnati, Kathy, I think I told you about this before. They took me to a place that used to be a railroad line and it went for I think almost a hundred miles or so. It was so unique and wonderful. It was alongside of a river as well. Yeah. And I just think that would be so interesting if we could do that with an old railway or something. Um, you could park along the way and stop and there were like little restaurant taverns and little uh, townships and things you could shop and visit whatnot along the way. It was just the most wonderful experience um, that a biker or a pedestrian uh, could have. I just put that out there. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, Kathy. That's, uh, I think the, in Cincinnati would probably be part of the towpath network. So that was probably the towpath that you were on. And a lot of communities in, in and around, and even in Pennsylvania have rail trails, um, like you, you mentioned too. Um, this, the county is actually working on ways by which they could incorporate rail trails and be part of the, what's called the industrial heartlands uh, corridor, which would span between West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio when fully developed. Now, that's a long-term project. In fact, it's so, so long-term. When I worked in West Virginia many years ago, I was on the West Virginia part of the Industrial Heartlands Coalition, Trail Coalition. So it's sort of a never-ending process. But they are looking at ways to incorporate a rail trail and a bike network throughout the, the, the county as a countywide initiative to be part of a larger project, like probably like the one that you were on, Kathy. They are fantastic. I, I'm a big, I, I, will, I will travel to um, visit uh, large rail trail networks and, and experience of those. Um, the Great Allegheny Passage is probably one of the, the biggest and most well-known that uh, connects. How far does it go? Jeff, you're, you're agreeing with me, so you're familiar. It goes to DC all the way to does it go to Pittsburgh? Is it? It, it the gap goes from Pittsburgh to, to uh, Cumberland, Maryland, and then you could pick up the CNO Canal towpath. So it's yeah. probably very similar to what you're talking about, Councilwoman, to go all the way into into DC. My my son and I rode it a few years ago, and uh, I'll tell you, folks in the towns along the trail are thrilled to see it. Very, I mean, just so happy to see people there who are patronizing businesses and having a good time. It really has brought a lot of people together. It's an enormous effort. As Kathy mentioned, it's, it's a, as Kathy Rostick mentioned, it's a, it's a multi-year, multi-decade potentially process, but the results are absolutely worth it. And I know they did an economic impact study um, of the Allegheny Passage and, and it's, it was mind boggling, the impact, the little bit of investment and the return on that investment particularly for the small towns that were on that uh, system was huge. It really was quite impressive. Um, so it would, yeah, it would certainly be interesting if we could get something akin to that throughout the county. I agree with the rail trail um, idea. There's been many areas. I too have ridden from Pittsburgh to DC and also some other rail trails here and there. Well, the CNO, well, the one that goes south of Cleveland to, uh, back when I rode it the last time, it only went to Akron, but just amazing infrastructure, amazing benefits to all the little communities along the way. And it was just this, uh, in a lot of cases, it's this large linear park that, has just so many things going on, on uh, along it. And uh, the one area that I think of in our community is 19th Street. There's been a track that 
uh, basically was taken out uh, from, I don't know, around State Street out to, um, well, almost out to Green Garden. And it would be such a wonderful uh, east-west route. And I don't, I've never really looked at to see where all it can go into the east side, but I assume that you could take it from somewhere out to the east side and then out to the Mill Creek line. It's a good idea, Eric. And you know, one thing that we want to keep in mind too is that we're focused on, well, there are a number of different benefits that active transportation has for community. Uh, certainly recreational uses like this are beneficial, not just for their own benefits, but because they can create economic um, stimulation for businesses, for lack of a better term. We also want to see if there are routes through the city, how they can best serve city residents and businesses. So ideally a trail routing through a city will serve both of those needs. And uh, so you get the most benefit you possibly can from a new facility. Hi, I'd also like to mention um, at the county level, uh, we have two members here at the county that are on the board of the Erie to Pittsburgh Trail. And there's been a lot of interest and movement trying to get the Erie to Pittsburgh Trail through the city and actually end um, at a place on Jobbins Landing. So that might be something uh, we can try to mention in this plan. I can try to get some more information about exactly where all that stands, but but it has a lot of opportunity um, potentially to use more rails to trails and bring people from Pittsburgh to Erie and Erie to Pittsburgh. Thank you. I think I see another, um, Freda had another comment that she wanted to make. Yeah, I'm familiar from my time in Washington State with local improvement districts that a neighborhood can if enough people vote, have, um, have the city help them to improve their sidewalks. I know that Little Italy, through the sisters uh, there, that they got funding to do sidewalks. I don't know whether the, and some of them was, it, we were not just on West 18th Street, but some were in the residential segments. So, so I have a couple things and then you can finish. But I have, I wondered how can other neighborhoods get that kind of assistance um, getting sidewalks. I've created a neighborhood on next door and we would like to you know, be more involved. The other thing is how do we get enforcement of getting the sidewalks cleared of snow and vegetation? That seems to be a very difficult question for people. So uh, I'm not sure I, Kathy or others want to speak to the enforcement question, but um, you know, in terms of involvement in getting sidewalks repaired or, or installed, that, that's really the focus of this plan. So the input that's being provided through this process is helping us understand where that needs to occur. I, I, I don't really have a lot to add regarding enforcement. Um, I know we, we certainly are challenged with that across the city. Um, when it, during the winter. Yeah. Lisa, did you want to say something to that? No, I think maybe we just muted, but anyway, I, I don't. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to read some of the comments too. Yeah, I'm making copies of them too, Kathy. So yeah, I'm sure so. I can send you a transcript of the comments when the meeting is over. Thank you. Uh, Andrea also mentions tactical urbanism, which is a 
a term that you might want to look up if you want to find more information about how things are done quickly. We've worked on a number of projects in, in various communities that have used things like that for, um, you know, basically kind of found materials to, to put in protected bike lanes or to put in traffic calming or things like that, um, that the city needs to bless, of course, but it doesn't require the, the time consuming and expensive process that's required of a typical capital project. And frankly, you know, most of the places where we've worked and the places that I've, I've read about, they involve a lot of community ownership as well. So that's a chance really for communities to come together and develop some solutions that they think are appropriate. And all the city needs to do is review and make sure it's okay rather than having to go through a very long and involved process. Thank you for that. All right, Jeff and Leah, I think we're, we're at our hour. Um, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think we got some fantastic feedback exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I see your comments, Fred. I just want to make sure you know we're, we're taking that down, the enforcement. I, I just didn't have a good response. I don't know the, the status of enforcement of those issues that you brought up. Um, so I can't really speak to them on this call, but we'll certainly bring them up with the steering committee and as we develop the plan as uh, something that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, Kathy, thanks every Kathy Schaff, City Councilwoman Kathy Schaff, thanks everyone for participating to, for today. Um, I certainly uh, agree with that. This was very, very helpful um, and we appreciate uh, the feedback and we'll incorporate that into the recommendations, of course, as we move forward. Jeff and Leah, was there anything else that you'd like to, to say? Yes, two things. Uh, please encourage everyone you know, um, friends, family, folks who are not friends that you happen to know, uh, who, who live or travel in Erie to participate in the survey, activeerie.com, I believe is. Yep. Frank posted it at the very beginning. Um, yep, activeerie.com. Participate in the survey if you haven't already. Um, if you could encourage folks to participate in our, our second session, which is tomorrow at one o'clock, it's exactly like this. So if you've been here, no reason to go through that again, but um, encourage other people to. We want to reach as many people as we can. We won't reach as many as we could if we were in person, but we want to come close. So the more folks you can encourage to participate, the better off we all are. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.